1941, a date which will live in infamy. The devastating air assault on Pearl Harbor thrust the reluctant United States into a clash with the Axis powers. The militarists of Berlin and Tokyo started this war, but the mass angered forces of common humanity will finish it. Battles raged around the world, in the air, on land, and at sea, to preserve the ideals of democracy. They know that victory for us means victory for freedom. The fate of the world was at stake. If we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. World War II was the most terrific conflict in human history. It spanned the globe and half a decade, and sparked political, military, and social repercussions that echoed throughout the 20th century and beyond. this before, but I shall say it again and again. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign war. In 1940, Franklin Roosevelt campaigned on the promise to keep the nation out of foreign entanglements, well aware that the American voter had no taste for war. But the president and the country had cause for alarm. With each passing month, the Axis powers' tide of aggression spread, threatening to engulf the world. By the fall of 1941, Adolf Hitler's Blitzkrieg had crushed resistance across Europe, leaving a wake of death and destruction. A Nazi invasion of Britain was stalled, but Hitler vowed to smash the island nation. Half a world away in the Pacific, Japan's Minister of War, Hideki Tojo, forged a brutal reputation with a murderous invasion of Manchuria and an attack on French Indochina. On December 7, 1941, the Foreign War came to America. In the space of two hours, a Japanese air assault on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, decimated the U.S. Pacific Fleet and killed nearly 2,500 servicemen. Within three days, the world was at war. The president braced the country for the challenges that lay ahead. We are now in this war. We're all in it, all the way. Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. Just two years earlier, the U.S. military was weak and the nation ill-prepared for battle. But as events overseas became increasingly ominous, the country began to rebuild its armed forces. December 7th shocked the nation into dramatic action. Remember Pearl Harbor became America's battle cry. Eager young men, anxious to fight, flocked to armed services recruiting offices. Over five million volunteered for duty. 10 million more were drafted during the war. After eight weeks of basic training, these new recruits were battle-trained and ready to fight. New soldiers were given uniforms, weapons, supplies, and standard haircuts. Everything they needed was government issue. It wasn't long before soldiers themselves were being referred to as government issue or GIs. Americans from all walks of life and ethnic backgrounds signed up for the armed forces. Over one million African Americans served during the war, though segregation and prejudice forced them into support positions until near the end of the war. Women joined the fight too. During the war, over 250,000 women served in many roles throughout the world, such as pilots, nurses, and mechanics. <laughs> 
As the U.S. built its fighting forces, the president called upon the nation's manufacturing might to build the implements of war needed to fight the enemy. We shall need everything that we have and everything that our allies have to defeat the Nazis and the fascists in the coming battles on the continent of Europe and the Japanese on the continent of Asia and in the islands of the Pacific. The U.S. mobilization for war stands among the monumental achievements in American history. In record time, the U.S. economy was completely transformed from producing peacetime goods to maximum war production. FDR established the War Production Board, the WPB, to direct the effort, and he set demanding goals. In this year, 1942, we shall produce 60,000 planes, 45,000 tanks, 20,000 anti-aircraft guns. We shall build 8 million tons of merchant ships. Nationwide drives were organized to collect scrap iron and tin, rags, paper, even cooking fat to be recycled into war supplies. And metals and other raw materials were diverted for use in war production. New defense plants and shipyards sprang up seemingly overnight, and existing factories were converted to military manufacturing. Industrialist Henry J. Kaiser became a national hero as his shipyards built nearly 1,500 Liberty ships. Henry Ford's massive assembly lines turned out a B-24 bomber every 63 minutes. And the nation's railroads made delivering raw materials and war supplies their top priority. After a decade-long depression, war production revitalized the U.S. economy. Suddenly, a nation with too few jobs had to work overtime to supply the Allied effort. As the nation's men left for the fighting front, women joined the workforce to fill the vacant positions. Many of them took jobs in the defense industry, making Rosie the Riveter a legend of wartime production. African Americans migrated from the rural South to work in the industrial centers of the North and West. Many were refused jobs because of race. As a result, President Roosevelt issued an executive order barring hiring discrimination in defense industries and the government, and established the Fair Employment Practice Committee to report on unfair work practices, opening the doors of employment for more than two million African Americans. By the end of the war, U.S. industry and the American worker were producing more weapons and firepower than all other nations combined. Superior technology would prove vital to defeating the enemy. President Roosevelt established the OSRD, the Office of Scientific Research and Development, to bring America's leading scientists into the war effort. Many innovations developed or improved during World War II are still used today, like radar and sonar technology needed to spot enemy airplanes and submarines, and so-called miracle drugs like penicillin, which prevented the infection of battlefield wounds. Secretly, the OSRD was supervising a weapons project that would play a deciding role in the war, the creation of the first atomic bomb. The cost of war was staggering. To finance the effort, government advertisements encouraged citizens to buy war bonds. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. What do they ask of us, the heroes we mourn? What do they ask of us, our marching sons across the seas? To stand shoulder to shoulder with them, here at home to do the job of forging the guns of vengeance. Bonds are our weapons. Stop on the way out. You want to say what's in your heart? Say it with bonds. Americans responded investing over $185 billion toward victory. Congress raised income taxes and, for the first time, deducted federal taxes from paychecks each week. To control inflation, Congress created the Office of Price Administration, the OPA, which froze the price of many goods. The OPA issued ration books, limiting the purchase of groceries, clothing, and fuel, and sending the badly needed surplus to supply Allied soldiers. 
Americans grew victory gardens for food. They cut back on travel and carpooled or rode bicycles to save precious gasoline. Driving alone was considered unpatriotic. The attack on Pearl Harbor unified the country in many ways, but it also stirred long-standing prejudice against Japanese immigrants in America. Bowing to political pressure, President Roosevelt ordered the immediate relocation of over 110,000 Japanese Americans to remote detention camps. They were forced to abandon or sell their homes and businesses, in some cases, overnight. Many lost everything. More than 70,000 of the relocated were Nisei, Japanese Americans born in America and citizens of the U.S. Despite the unfair treatment, the interned Japanese Americans did their best to make the camps tolerable and remain loyal to the United States. Many Nisei even became U.S. soldiers. Regrettably, more than 100,000 Japanese Americans spent the entire war in detention camps. On December 22, 1941, just two weeks after Pearl Harbor, Winston Churchill arrived in Washington to meet with President Roosevelt. The British Prime Minister was grateful for a new ally in his fight against the Axis and outspoken in his opinion of the enemy. What kind of a people do they think we are? Is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget? FDR and Churchill met for two weeks, plotting their war strategy. The leaders agreed that defeating Hitler would be their top priority. Once Europe was freed, Allied forces could be redeployed to help the U.S. defeat Japan. The plan was set. But through the bleak months of 1942, the Nazi war machine marched on. In the Atlantic, Germany's submarine attack groups, wolf packs, devastated Allied shipping, Nazi influence spread through the Mediterranean and into North Africa, threatening British colonies there. On the Eastern Front, German forces pushed deep into the Soviet Union and descended on the city of Stalingrad. In the skies over Europe, German anti-aircraft artillery exacted a heavy toll on Allied warplanes. President Roosevelt knew the first step toward victory in Europe was to secure the transatlantic supply lines. The Axis powers can never achieve their objective of world domination unless they first obtain control of the sea. To counter the U-boat menace, Allied warships began escorting supply ships across the sea in convoys. Air reconnaissance, long-range torpedo bombers, and the new technology of sonar helped the Allied forces spot and destroy the German subs. A major breakthrough came when the British cracked Germany's coded communications. As a result, the Battle of the Atlantic swung in favor of the Allies, and the German U-boat threat was neutralized. It was a critical turn in the war. With shipping lanes reopened, U.S. war supplies began to flow freely to Great Britain, and preparations began for the first Allied land offensive. It came in November 1942, as U.S. General Dwight Eisenhower led 107,000 Allied troops ashore in Morocco and Algeria in North Africa. The British Army was locked in a fierce battle with German General Erwin Rommel and his Axis forces. Eisenhower's troops battled eastward, while the British fought west, trapping the Axis army in Tunisia. Months of heavy fighting ensued, and 70,000 Allied lives were lost. But the Allies prevailed, and General Rommel was forced to flee to Germany, leaving his once unstoppable Africa Corps to surrender. <laughs> 
The war was far from over, but British Prime Minister Churchill knew the Battle of North Africa was a defining moment. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. While the U.S. and Britain, the Western Allies, were fighting in North Africa, the Soviet Red Army refused to surrender the city of Stalingrad in the face of an overwhelming German onslaught. In November 1942, the Soviets launched a heroic counterattack. The violent struggle lasted for two months. As the bitter winter set in, the German army faced frostbite, lice, starvation, and defeat. The epic Battle of Stalingrad devastated the city and left over one million Russians dead. But now, the victorious Soviet army began a steady march westward towards Germany. By the summer of 1943, Allied warplanes were bombing German cities day and night, slowly reducing them to rubble. Most attacks were aimed at military and industrial targets, like bridges, supply depots, and factories. But increasingly, Allied air forces targeted civilian centers for so-called terror bombing, designed to demoralize the German public. In one raid on the city of Dresden, the Allies dropped tons of incendiary bombs, creating a firestorm that killed more than 100,000. Before the war's end, over 650,000 innocent Germans perished from Allied bombing. In July 1943, Allied troops struck off from North Africa in Operation Husky. Their mission was to invade Sicily, the stepping stone to the European continent. Within a month, the Italian island was under Allied control, and Italians revolted against their fascist leader, Benito Mussolini. Italy's king stripped Mussolini of power and turned his back on Hitler, quitting the Axis alliance. More weary Italians rejoiced. Despite the success of Operation Husky, it would take another 18 months of bloody fighting to drive the remaining Axis forces out of Italy. In April 1945, Mussolini was captured by Italian resistance fighters while trying to flee the country. The once pompous dictator was executed, and his body hung in Milan Square. While the Soviet army marched through Poland and the Allies pushed north through Italy, Allied leaders finalized plans for the invasion of Nazi-occupied France and the liberation of Western Europe. The mission was codenamed Operation Overlord, but history would remember it as D-Day. It was the largest military operation ever mounted and would define an entire generation. The Allies would mount a massive assault across the English Channel onto the Normandy coast over 176,000 troops and 5,000 ships prepared for the operation. On June 5th, 1944, Allied troops mobilized. Warplanes departed from Britain, dropping paratroopers behind enemy lines. Allied bombers strafed the coastline. Battleships pummeled German defenses, while amphibious landing craft crossed the English Channel toward Normandy. At daybreak on June 6, 1944, D-Day, British, Canadian, and American soldiers fought their way ashore. The Allies sustained heavy casualties, but managed to secure their beachheads and the massive supplies needed to fight the ground war came ashore. President Roosevelt led the nation in prayer. Our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Within a month, there were a million Allied troops on the continent, fighting their way across France. As the Allies drew near to Paris, Hitler ordered the city burned, 
the German commander in charge refused, and on August 25, 1944, he surrendered the city to French resistance fighters. By September, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and much of the Netherlands were freed from Nazi control, while the Soviet Red Army closed in on Germany from the east. By October, the Allies had captured the German city of Aachen, but Hitler ordered a counterattack near the border with Belgium. The resulting dent in the Allied line gave the fight its name, the Battle of the Bulge. The Allies were pushed back with heavy losses of men and equipment. 100,000 Nazi and 19,000 Allied soldiers were killed. But in the end, the German army was forced to retreat. It would be their last offensive. Hitler's dream of a thousand-year Reich was crumbling. His country was in ruin, shattered by the onslaught of bombing and shelling. Over five million of his soldiers had surrendered to the advancing Allied armies, and the German spirit was broken. On April 23rd, the Soviet army stormed the German capital of Berlin. In the face of defeat, Adolf Hitler took his own life rather than surrender. Here is a news flash. The German radio has just announced that Hitler is dead. 200,000 Russian soldiers died capturing Berlin. Finally, on May 7, 1945, the German High Command surrendered to Allied leaders. The long war in Europe was over. There was joy and victory, but with Germany defeated, Allied troops came face to face with evidence of Nazi atrocities. Auschwitz, Dachau, Treblinka, Buchenwald concentration camps housing thousands of living corpses. Countless Jews put to death in crematoriums and gas chambers. Mass graves holding thousands of bodies. Evidence of gruesome medical experiments conducted by the Nazis on their captives. History would reveal the true horrors of the Holocaust. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin from CBS World News. A press association has just announced that President Roosevelt is dead. Twelve years in the White House, a Great Depression and the world's greatest war had taken their toll on Franklin Roosevelt. With the passing of America's commander-in-chief, the weight of war fell to Harry S. Truman. Fighting in Europe was over, but the battle against Japan raged on. The new president would take extraordinary measures to finish the war and return the world to peace. The Japanese people have felt the weight of our land, air, and naval attack. Our blows will not cease until the Japanese military and naval forces lay down their arms in unconditional surrender. By the time President Truman assumed office in April 1945, the United States was winning the war against the Japanese and moving swiftly toward a land invasion of Japan's home islands. But over three years of fighting in the Pacific had been every bit as perilous and costly as the war in Europe. In the months following Pearl Harbor, Japan captured the U.S. outposts of Guam and Wake Island, and the British colonies of Hong Kong and Singapore. In the Philippine Islands, Supreme Allied Commander in the Pacific, General Douglas MacArthur, was ordered to flee from a Japanese invasion leaving behind 100,000 U.S. and Filipino troops as prisoners of war. MacArthur vowed revenge. I shall return. Despite the disastrous start, American spirits were lifted in April 1942. Colonel James Doolittle led a successful bombing run on Tokyo in a move designed to strike fear into the very heart of the Japanese. <laughs> 
A month later, in the Battle of the Coral Sea, U.S. and Australian forces resisted an enemy attack, preventing a Japanese invasion of Australia. In June 1942, the Japanese launched a secret plan to capture a U.S. military outpost at the Midway Islands, a thousand miles from Hawaii. But the U.S. intercepted a secret communication and sent a carrier group to ambush the approaching armada. Japan struck first. Waves of warplanes attacked U.S. forces on the island, inflicting heavy damage. The U.S. responded, sending torpedo planes and dive bombers to attack the Imperial fleet. The first squadron met fierce resistance and suffered tremendous losses. But then, within the space of an hour, the U.S. turned the tide of battle by destroying three Japanese aircraft carriers. By late afternoon, Japan was in full retreat. Six months after Pearl Harbor, the Battle of Midway was a major turning point in the war with Japan. From that point forward, the United States was on the offensive. General MacArthur devised the strategy of island hopping to fight the Japanese in the Pacific. The U.S. would island hop past Japan's heavily defended islands and seize the more easily defeated outposts. There, the United States could build landing strips and employ air power to cut Japan's supply lines. By August 1944, the U.S. was island hopping steadily toward Japan, capturing Guadalcanal. Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. By October, the U.S. Navy reached the Philippines. In the Battle of Leyte Gulf, they fought the Japanese fleet in one of the greatest naval operations in history. The U.S. prevailed. General MacArthur had kept his promise to return. After the crushing defeat, the desperate Japanese began using what they called the Divine Wind. Kamikaze attacks. In these suicidal maneuvers, Japanese pilots dove onto Allied ships in bomb-loaded aircraft. Kamikaze attacks destroyed 36 U.S. warships, badly damaged 368 others, and killed over 5,000 sailors. But the Divine Wind failed to stop the Allied advance on Japan. President Truman set November 1945 as the date for a land invasion of Japan. But to stage the attack, the U.S. would first need to capture the heavily fortified islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Advanced air and naval bombardments were meant to soften enemy defenses for an amphibious invasion. But once on shore, U.S. Marines were forced to fight a terrifying war of attrition. Snipers fired on the advancing soldiers from hidden entrenchments. The Marines fought back using flamethrowers and hand grenades to destroy the underground enemy. When the last shots were fired, over 18,000 Marines had died fighting on Iwo Jima and Okinawa. 90,000 Japanese soldiers were dead. Over 100,000 Okinawans perished as well. Many of those who survived were homeless and shell-shocked. As the U.S. marched across the sea toward Japan, daily raids by American B-29 bombers were destroying Japanese cities and killing thousands of civilians. In a single firebomb attack on Tokyo, over 100,000 innocent Japanese were incinerated. For Japan, Defeat was inevitable, but the island nation refused to surrender. The mounting loss of life worried President Truman. Military advisors cautioned that a quarter of a million American lives could be lost invading Japan. Shortly after becoming president, Harry Truman learned of the Manhattan Project, a code name for the best kept secret of World War II, a nuclear weapon powerful enough to destroy an entire city. Testing in the New Mexico desert proved the atomic bomb not only worked, it was even more powerful than scientists predicted. President Truman was faced with a sobering decision. Use the horrible weapon to end the war, 
or risk the lives of countless Allied troops in a land assault on Japan. With the urging of top aides and military advisors, Truman decided to drop the bomb on Japan. The Allies issued a final appeal to Japan's military leaders to unconditionally surrender. This was known as the Potsdam Ultimatum. Still, Japan's military leaders remained defiant. At 2.45 a.m. on August 6, 1945, a B-29 bomber, the Enola Gay, headed out over the Pacific toward the Japanese military center of Hiroshima. At 8 o'clock, the atomic bomb dropped clear of the plane. Forty-three seconds later, the city of Hiroshima was annihilated. That afternoon, President Truman again called for Japan to surrender. When Japan failed to respond, a second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, leveling half of the city and killing more than 60,000. By the end of the year, the death toll had reached more than 200,000 from injuries and radiation poisoning caused by the two bombs. Finally, amid scenes of unimaginable death and destruction, Japan's Emperor Hirohito capitulated. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. On September 2, 1945, Japan formally surrendered aboard the U.S. battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. The Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers will now sign on behalf of all the nations at war with Japan. The war was finally over, and the world celebrated. was the deadliest conflict in human history. More than 50 million soldiers and civilians died during the fighting, including 300,000 U.S. soldiers. The Holocaust alone claimed the lives of 11 million. With the guns of aggression silenced, it was time to begin the long, slow task of rebuilding countries savaged by the fighting. In February 1945, three months before the defeat of Germany, Allied leaders met at Yalta in the Soviet Union to discuss Europe's reorganization. Other post-war plans were laid at the conference in Potsdam, Germany, five months later. While touring the ruins of Berlin, President Truman expressed hope for a more peaceful time ahead. We're here today to raise the flag of victory over the capital of our greatest adversary. In doing that, we must remember that in raising that flag, we are raising it in the name of the people of the United States who are looking forward to a better world, a peaceful world, a world in which all the people will have an opportunity to enjoy the good things of life and not just a few at the top. Post-war Germany was divided into four zones, individually administered by the U.S., Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. However, distrust between the Soviets and the Western Allies escalated, ushering in a 50-year-long period of icy relations that would come to be called the Cold War. In 1946, an international tribunal tried Nazi leaders in Nuremberg, Germany. The first time in history, a nation's leaders were held accountable for war crimes. Japanese military leaders were put on trial as well, including General Tocho, who was convicted and executed for his crimes. The closing months of the war also saw the birth of the United Nations, an international peacekeeping organization to succeed the League of Nations. After the war, Japan was occupied by U.S. forces, commanded by General MacArthur. He introduced economic reforms to the country, 
leading Japan's markets to become among the world's most powerful. And MacArthur restructured their political system as well, convincing Japan to allow suffrage for women and other basic civic freedoms. The United States was changed as well. The weakness of war-ravaged Europe and the growing threat of the Soviet Union led the U.S. to a new role as the world's leading economic and military power. Before his death, President Roosevelt expressed hope that those who followed could learn from the horrors of this terrible war. We have faith that future generations will know that here, in the middle of the 20th century, there came a time when men of good will found a way to unite and produce and fight to destroy the forces of ignorance and intolerance Slavery and war. It would take decades to fully realize the changes wrought by World War II. But as soldiers returned home, they found their country and themselves fundamentally changed. And for many, a new, more prosperous, and more peaceful life lay ahead.